to do all of this for free to sort of further the art of radio. And as the returns from the circular and the application began to come in at NAWA headquarters, it was evident that amateurs were responding with enthusiasm. So NAWA received several hundred replies. There was a problem, though. Reception on 1,600 meters was, in most cases, an unknown quantity for these folks. So many of the applicants stated that they didn't have the proper equipment to receive there, and many responses indicated that hams never listened on that wavelength, so maybe they should change the wavelength. Um, most of the replies suggested that amateurs were comfortable in wavelengths below 600 meters. That was generally where people hung out at the time. So the mass of volunteers was winnowed down, but there was a further problem. So in the final report prepared by NAWA, uh, that organization also noted that very few amateurs possess proper loudspeaking equipment. This is before the age of loudspeakers, electronic loudspeakers, I should say. So uh, in his interview to a journalist from the New York Herald Tribune in 1926, uh, White also mentioned this problem, telling the reporter that, quote, first of all, there were practically no loudspeakers in existence. Imagine that, end quote. So what NAWA did was, with the help of RCA, they rigged up some loudspeakers. White, again reminiscing about the jury rigging, said, quote, Earphone arrangements, such as are used by the deaf, had to be improvised into loudspeakers by attaching them to old tin tulip horns, which were relics of the early days of the phonograph, end quote. So that was their loudspeaking equipment. And NAWA sent these very much not high-tech instruments uh, to all of those who needed them. So all of these uh, questions and the preparations were because NAWA wanted everything to be perfect. There was a lot riding on this stunt. NAWA's reputation, especially in comparison to the ARRLs, who said that this couldn't be done, uh, but also RCA's reputation, who had gambled a lot of money on this. And there were a lot of things that could go wrong. So in the end, NAWA set up a little over 50 listening stations spread out over 48 cities in a 200-mile radius. So they erred on the conservative side for placing these listening stations since the transmitter actually hadn't been tested by June 22nd when the theaters were booked, and the fight was scheduled for July 2nd. It left them about a week to make sure everything was working. Um, so here's a map of the official station, so you can probably find Jersey City somewhere in there. Uh, and all those blue dots represent the official stations. Uh, some cities had more than one official listening station, so they just have one dot on the map. So um, once they had the listening stations set up, NAWA had to make sure that people would show up to these listening stations, but that wasn't too hard. After all, there was huge interest in the fight anyway. Uh, newspaper bureaus were also organizing something similar. They would be charging admission to allow people to be among the first to hear the telegraph returns that came from the wire service that would be read out loud. So to sweeten the deal for going to a radio listening session, NAWA organizers promised that all the proceeds from ticket sales would go to war widows and be split between the American Committee for Devastated France and the Navy Club. So the latter was the condition that FDR gave in exchange for letting them use the Navy transmitter. Uh, but the organizers also used the opportunity to further the cause of radio itself. An ad for the Playhouse Theater in Wilmington, Delaware, touted the, quote, scientific sensation of the century, end quote. That, see that theater sold out every one of its 574 seats. Uh, the Lyceum Theater in Ithaca, New York, included a preliminary talk that explained wireless uh, telephony. Um, and uh, as it was called at the time. And there's also another ad uh, for a listening station at Harrisburg, Pennsylvania in the Chestnut Street Auditorium. And they boasted that they had a whole, quote, staff of experts to bring att attendees news of this, quote, unprecedented novel, scientific, educational, as well as most interesting undertaking. But would this scheme work? Uh, that wasn't yet clear, and it must have been quite a nail-biter for J. Andrew White, because all of these preparations were done before any of the equipment on either the transmitting or the receiving side was tested. Can you imagine uh, giving that much effort into something that they'd never tested before? Um, so they had to test them. 
every radio amateur who sent in an application to NAWA, regardless of whether they were chosen for the sponsored listening sites, they received information about the preliminary testing that would take place the week before the actual fight. Um, so here's a, here's a picture of one of those uh, tests. So these test broadcasts were important for the undertaking because, again, it still wasn't clear that everything would work. Uh, since the idea to broadcast the fight wasn't cemented until a month before the actual event, J. Andrew White, engineers at RCA, and people at NAWA were running on a really tight schedule with almost no room for error. So I'm going to tell you about the test. I'm not going to go through all of the technical uh, specifics, but I'll give you a broad outline. First test was held Friday, June 24th with an antenna current of four amps. So General Electric, the owner of the transmitter, they sent its chief engineer, W.J. Purcell, to supervise. And he was actually the one who held down the output to make sure that everything was working properly. The results of the first test were not great, uh, but neither they, were they unexpected. Uh, this first test was just to see if the transmitter would work at all. Check, transmitter seems to work. The next day, a uh, test was done from 2 to 4 p.m., the same hours as the actual fight would be on July 2nd. So the antenna current then was about 8 amps, and radio operators were instructed to phone or cable NAWA headquarters in New York City to let them know the listening results from their cities. And it seemed that this test worked somewhat better, but still it was not reaching all the places that it needed to reach. So the following day was Sunday. There were no test broadcasts. Instead, RCA engineers fiddled with the antenna. Uh, the next test was Monday evening, June 27th, and things seemed to be working better than it had in previous days based on the reports that came in. Um, but uh, it was determined that the set still wasn't modulating as efficiently as it should have been. So engineers went over the rig with a fine-toothed comb. Uh, they determined two problems, a condenser and shunt to the plate resistance coil was short-circuited, and the filament heating transformer wasn't supplying adequate voltage to the tube. So with those two problems fixed, they did one final and unscheduled test on June 30th, really cutting the whole thing quite close. Again, the fight was July 2nd, but that was it. Uh, the antenna current was 12 amps, and distant stations that had previously reported either faint or non-existent signals telephoned into Hoboken to say that they could pick up everything. So the amateurs were ready, more than 7,000 of them. They had already, at the request of NAWA, contacted several newspapers who covered the upcoming radio broadcast, and all of this publicity worked. People flocked to their nearest radio receiver to get the results. Even in places where NAWA didn't organize official listening stations, amateurs figured out a way to get the fight to the masses. So the original questionnaire that I told you about stressed that even if operators weren't chosen for the official sites, they were still very much encouraged to interest the manager of a local theater or hall to run the returns or even play them in their homes to friends. And amateurs all over the country did just that. The Monongahela Valley Radio, Station, Radio um, Association of Fairmont, West Virginia, for example, they held a bunch of meetings at their local Y to discuss how they could receive the fight, especially since they were so far away and they couldn't get the results via, via loudspeaker. But still, they set up a listening station for a few friends. Everybody shared a couple of headphones. Uh, not every club was so lucky. The Hackensack, New Jersey Radio Club, for example, which also met at their local YMCA, they were actually banned from playing the results of the, of the fight uh, because the director of the uh, YMCA disapproved of boxing. So they didn't want him to play it at the YMCA, but that's okay. They went to the local, ball, uh, the, the local uh, baseball field, set up a transmitter, set up a station there, and they played the results to a bunch of baseball fans. Um, people gathered in homes, in halls, in churches, and in the case of W. Harold Warren of Asbury Park, the boardwalk, to hear the fight. So he, uh, he had his rolling chair, his like tricycle type thing. Uh, it had a loop antenna, a detector, and a two-step amplifier. 
which allowed, he later wrote to Wireless Age, quote, each sound of the gong to seem as though uh, it were a few feet from the roller chair instead of in Jersey City, notwithstanding the fact that there were but 100 feet from the noise of the breaking surf, end quote. Uh, so it was great. People who went to go uh, on their bathing holiday, all of a sudden they heard from the air with no wires the sound of a, of a, of a boxing match they had heard of, but they didn't know that they could listen to it in this way. It was absolutely magical to these people. So 300 miles from the fight, an amateur in Hardwick, Vermont, picked up the entire fight with a two-step amplification setup. On a yacht owned by William Vanderbilt, an operator accidentally picked up the broadcast while he was tuning a set and played the fight to Mr. Vanderbilt and all of his guests, uh, all of whom were, according to the operator, very much impressed. Um, not everyone had state-of-the-art equipment either. In Jamaica, in Queens, uh, an operator with a crystal set heard the returns on, with a pair of headphones. Uh, also, the signal spread even farther west than expected because Westinghouse's East Pittsburgh KDKA station picked up the signal from the original broadcast and sent it through a repeater. So the day after the fight, the New York Times reported that the broadcast reached as far south as Florida and as far north as Vermont. Overall, RCA estimated that some 500,000 people listened into the fight on the radio, though real numbers were probably more like 300,000, which still was no small feat. So here it is, phone report of battle to over 5,000 people. Uh, um, articles like this filled newspapers all over the country. Um, for their service, uh, people, in this case, C.R. Vincent Jr., they were given a certificate to commemorate their involvement with facsimile signatures from the two boxers, J. Andrew White on behalf of Nawa, uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt on behalf of the Navy Club, as well as Tex Rickard and a bunch of others. So what about the broadcast itself? So I mentioned before that a lot of people thought that this idea was, to put it plainly, kind of a dumb one. So when, Julia, when Julius Hopp approached the ARRL, you'll remember they said that the greatest range could only be 100 miles and that it would never be able to be heard over loudspeakers. Uh, Westinghouse said similar things and said it had to be the fledgling company RCA, which made and paid for the technical arrangements that were needed. So all in all, RCA spent almost $2,000 on the project, a high sum in 1921, especially for a publicity stunt that many people weren't sure wouldn't work, would work in the first place. But the scheme did work. So an article in Wireless Age called it a triumph. The article said that, quote, the magic of the radio telephone had accomplished new wonders. A daring idea had become a fact. It was a triumph, but more than that, it was history in the making, end quote. That report glides over the fact that from a technological point of view, things weren't quite so rosy. Uh, the transmitter, although powerful, ended up massively overheating and was, was reduced to a very expensive bit of slag, uh, probably to the consternation of the Navy, though I still haven't found any correspondence with FDR and White when FDR realized he wasn't getting his really expensive transmitter back. I'm still looking. If I find anything, I will report back. Um, However, events really luckily were on RCA's side because although they lost the transmitter, Dempsey was a good fighter and knocked out Carpentier after only about 10 minutes. Uh, and the final knockout came moments before the transmitter blew. So uh, the idea had originally been that the winner would travel to the shack, say a few words, uh, but that didn't happen. But luckily, everybody was too busy cheering or commiserating over the... Uh, over the, the result that nobody noticed that there was no more radio broadcast. This was also a really big win for David Sarnoff, who received a telegram from London from his boss, RCA's chairman, Owen Young, who congratulated him and said, quote, you have made history. Sarnoff sent a copy of J. Andrew White's final report about the Dempsey fight, along with the astounding and inflated listenership numbers, to various RCA managers and directors. So in this cover letter, Sarnoff wrote that the Dempsey-Carpentier fight was, quote, an inspiring document and indicates the possibilities of radio devices for receiving broadcasted news, end quote. RCA's director of traffic, Lee Lemon, called it, quote, a wonderful demonstration, and RCA manager Leon D'Souza also offered his congratulations. 
So the publicity generated by the broadcast convinced RCA executives of the value of broadcasting, not just point-to-point -point communication. And they filed an application for the company's first permanent broadcast license and began to use the publicity garnered by it to sell radios. Uh, so here's an advertisement for another boxing match, um, also on RCA's WJZ Newark station, with the helpful reminder that, quote, if you haven't your RCA receiving set, see your nearest RCA victor today. Uh, and telling potential buyers uh, that for as low as $25 and for as high as $350, yikes, uh, they could get a lifetime of entertainment with a radio. So RCA would later trade on that history to sell even televisions. Uh, this ad, oh, there we go. Uh, this ad makes the connection between RCA being the first to transmit a radio boxing match and the first to broadcast a TV boxing match. So the, the Dempsey fight became lore in RCA's history. J. Andrew White, uh, he remained the announcer of sporting matches for WJZ. Uh, he's still the announcer for uh, this uh, match. There we go. And by 1923, he was being called a boxing expert. Uh, not too bad for a man who in 1921 had to practice boxing moves in front of the mirror to make sure he called the plays correctly. He had no idea anything about boxing. All he knew was amateur radio, but they needed an announcer. So there he was. Um, so the Dempsey-Carpentier fight wasn't the first radio broadcast. Obviously, first radio broadcasts were done by amateurs, but it also wasn't the first commercial radio broadcast. Uh, that was KDKA, who broadcast the results of the Harding-Cox presidential election. Spoiler alert, Harding won. Um, so that was in 1920. It also wasn't the first commercial broadcast of, of sporting match. St. Olaf's College in Minnesota, they had a radio set up in the gymnasium. They had been broadcasting sports for ages. Um, but the Dempsey-Carpentier fight was different. And in this difference, it's impossible to overstate the importance that amateurs had in getting this off the ground. So in his final report, R White wrote that, quote, um, this undertaking as a whole has done more to educate the amateurs of the country to the great usefulness of radio in a big way than has been true of any undertaking ever before handled in the realm of amateur radio. The broadcasting of July 2nd, viewed solely from an amateur standpoint, was without question the biggest thing ever done since amateur radio wore short pants. Letter after letter has been received, stating that the writers were glad to see that at last someone had done something worthwhile and had given amateur radio operators an opportunity to participate in, a, in an undertaking which really meant something and which gave the amateur an opportunity to participate in something man-sized. So in the interview with J. Andrew White that I mentioned before, White noted that uh, even without the Dempsey-Carpentier fight, quote, broadcasting would have come along, but when, nobody could say. After all, um, KDKA didn't make much of a splash when it first started broadcasting the year before. So there's an amateur connection to KDKA as well. A Westinghouse executive, uh, Henry P. Davis, he noticed the amateur broadcast coming out of a garage of an employee, a guy called uh, Frank Conrad. So Conrad had quite the radio broadcast gig going. His broadcasts were picked up in the local press as curiosities, and a local store even sold wireless sets so that people who didn't have the know-how to build their own sets could listen to these garage broadcasts. Um, Westinghouse, they saw a money-making possibility and moved Conrad's garage equipment into a Westinghouse building in East Pittsburgh on November 2nd, and they issued the first commercial radio broadcast. So of it, all we have is a transcript. No one actually thought to record it, uh, but a KDKA radio announcer later recreated it. This is KDKA of the Westinghouse Electric and Manufacturing Company in East Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We shall now broadcast the election returns. <clears throat> we are receiving these returns through the cooperation and by special arrangements with the Pittsburgh Post and Sun. The election returns will be broadcast as soon as they are received by us here at KDKA. We'd appreciate it if anyone hearing this broadcast would communicate with us 
as we are very anxious to know how far the broadcast is reaching and how it is being received. Write your card or letter to station KDKA, East Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And now, while we're waiting for the returns to come in over the telephone, direct from the Post and Sun, I'll give you the list of offices in today's presidential election. Here they are. Some 30 million Americans are electing a president of the United States, a vice president, 34 United States senators, 435 members of the House of Representatives, governors of 34 states, and thousands of minor offices, county judges, and officials. <coughs> okay, those are the offices to be filled. And here are the seven complete presidential tickets that are being voted on. I guess you all know these names pretty well by this time, but there's no harm repeating them. And we have to wait for the returns anyhow. Well, here's the list. Republican, Warren G. Harding and Calvin Coolidge. Democratic, James M. Cox and Franklin D. Roosevelt. Socialist, Eugene V. Debs and Seymour Stedman. Prohibition, Aaron S. Watkins and Lay Colvin. Farmer Labor, Parley S. Christensen and Max S. Hayes. Socialist Labor Party, William Cox and August Gilhas. Single Tax, R.C. McCauley and R.C. Barnum. Well, those are the candidates running for the various offices in this election. And we're going to stay right here and broadcast the returns as they come into us. So please stand by. So it, uh, it ended with uh, this phrase, we'd appreciate it if anyone hearing this broadcast would communicate with us as we are very anxious to know how far the broadcast is reaching and how it is being received. So that was the problem. The only people listening to these early broadcasts were the few people who had their own equipment. And that wasn't too many people. And most of these people were building their own equipment. So it wasn't your everyday average American. So Westinghouse estimated that 1,000 people listened to their first broadcast. But historians have called this a wildly inflated number. There were not that many people in Pittsburgh that had receiving sets. Um, so Westinghouse made this to try and sell people radios, but it ended up being a huge failure because the people who listened to the broadcast already had their own radios, didn't need to buy one from Westinghouse, and the people who might have wanted to buy a radio, they still had no idea what radio was because they couldn't hear the broadcast. So it's a chicken and an egg kind of problem. Um, so in 1921, RCA was also looking to sell more radio equipment. So White recalled that um, at RCA in March of 1921, quote, business had practically fallen to a standstill, end quote, and uh, sales uh, of parts to amateurs, quote, had fallen off so that advertising patronage for my magazine for Wireless World um, wireless age was practically nil. Something he continued had to be done to move the stuff off the dealer's shelves, end quote. Uh, in the end, that something wasn't just to broadcast an item of national interest. RCA and NAWA's crucial intervention was the step they took to, the, to convince average Americans that this technology was not just a silly hobby, but the basis of a new mass culture. And it worked. White later recalled that those same parts that had been languishing on the shelves in March were flying off of them in July. Quote, dealer's shelves were swept clean of radio parts, and overnight demand had sprung up for thousands of radio receivers, and the boom was on. RCA and other companies started to build receivers for the average person, and the average person bought them in droves. So the Dempsey-Carpentier fight uh, and, crucially, the help of amateurs that brought that broadcast to a large public really shaped the future of radio and truly brought this technology for the first time into the American consciousness in a big way. It wasn't the first radio broadcast, uh, but it was the first one that convinced the American public that they wanted radios in their own homes. Without the dedication of radio om with uh, of amateur operators, the history of radio in America likely would have had a different trajectory. 
Thank you so much for listening. Uh, and if you uh, like this talk, you should come visit our museum. Uh, we're the David Sarnoff Collection at the College of New Jersey. We have stuff on the history of broadcasting and a whole lot more. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs>
you have the very old call books, or you uh -huh. have a call book, all the Z calls are okay. Z, typically, they were doing work like that radio telephone. Oh, very cool. Uh huh. Anyway, just, just an aside. Cool. No, Radio that's great. Like that's great. Oh, thank you. I just I wanted to make a comment. You said that the first uh, investment was like around two thousand dollars. Yeah. For the station, while well, I checked the inflation of how much it would have been now, it would have been twenty-eight thousand, close to twenty-eight thousand five hundred dollars. So that would have been the cost today. And I want to add, since Fred is a history buff, I enjoy it as well. Uh, I worked for a radio station in Puerto Rico, WKAQ, mm -hmm. which was the first radio station in Puerto Rico to turn on the switch. It was also founded by ham radio operators, including one of them was governor of Puerto Rico at that time. He was governor, he was a ham radio operator, and he was involved in that. You know, uh, that Jesus Pinheiro. And here's the interesting part. It, they wanted to be the first radio station in the Caribbean. They couldn't accomplish that because the transmitter that was coming from the States, that was in December 1922. Uh, there was bad weather, they had mm -hmm. to stop in Cuba, so the owners of the station also had thought about founding a station and setting up a station there, they did it in Cuba. So Cuba had the first broadcast station in the Caribbean, then later on went to Puerto Rico, just to add a That's little cool. bit of Fred's uh, history. Yeah, there's a lot of cool um, amateur radio history and not... Not a whole lot of academic work on it. So I'm a professional historian. That's what I'm hoping to work on. But we'll see. Yeah. Just as an aside, don't trust 200 meters and down. That's the ARRL version of history, not necessarily the history. Okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. Another thing you might want to look into, you probably have already, a gentleman by the name of Doc Harold in <laughs> San Francisco as early as 1909 did some early phone broadcasts mm -hmm. using uh, a microphone and a spark transmitter. Yeah. And, that, and uh, his station later evolved into one of the West Coast stations. I don't recall which one, but there were regular broadcasts as far back as 1916. Mm -hmm. The guy's name was Doc Harold. Doc Harold, okay. Of course, there's also the Fessenden broadcast. Yes, yeah. The Christmas, the Christmas Day one that scared the pants out of everybody. Yeah. That's a good one. Yeah, right. Yeah. One XS was the call sign, by the way. Okay. <laughs> wow. You don't need a call book. You just need yeah, I just need to borrow you for a bit. Yeah. Thanks, Bobby. I forgot to say that. It's not your mind. Marconi's credited with the first transatlantic transmission. Whether he really was heard over there at Hudson Drop in Scotland is debatable now. Because he was transmitting around 1,000 kilohertz in the daytime with high D level absorption, and it's not too possible. It's not impossible, but it's not too likely. But let's give him credit for that. But it was a one way transmission. Fessenden, and just a few years after that, I think it was 19, I'm not sure of the year now, but it was some few years after that, was the first person to have transatlantic two way communication mm -hmm. using CW mode, by the way. Mm -hmm. In this way, not Spark. Marconi used Spark. Mm -hmm. And it was Fessenden who really should get the credit for the two way communication approach in that way. Yeah, Marconi was kind of like David Sarnoff never let the truth get in the way of good story or claiming priority on anything. He's a the promoter. Yeah, there you go. So, did he work with that team? He. So, yeah. Fred, Fred he, worked with that. He did work, yeah. <laughs> So you you probably were one of the other one of the other three. So there is the story of Sarnoff working the Titanic the way he told it. Yes. He locked himself in in the room and he was there the whole time. We've got the famous Titanic telegraph key. It's on display at the museum. It's so he was there. He went to work the day after. He was one of the three people. Um, but you can read the newspaper articles at the time. So he, he was interviewed. And the story changes year after year after year. <laughs> it's actually the same thing with the, with the Carpentier fight. Uh, Sarnoff, besides, you know, okaying the money, had no actual, um, had no actual, was not doing anything on the ground with the Dempsey-Carpentier fight. Um, later on, though, 
First, he says, oh, yes, I was the one who spearheaded it, which he was not. A couple of years later, he gives an, an, an interview, and he says, oh, I was there at the broadcast. He was not. So it's, it's a little bit hard to tell the story of RCA or maybe Marconi. Uh, there's a lot of inflation uh, of stories. Let's, let's put it that way. There you go. Yes. Yeah. The tower to the spire of the Lackawanna Railroad Station. Uh huh. Had that four wire antenna. Do you know what that was called? That antenna design. It was a T style, but I don't. Sorry. Flat top. Flat top. Okay. It was either center bed or end bed. Single wire. In which case, the wires would come down, or fanning down from one transmitter. By the way, that that antenna, I have a copy of an electrical experimenter from 1918. That antenna was originally a, used with spark transmission to communicate between either like the station. They had other stations. You know, uh, so they left the antenna. antenna the yes, the water and the power. Yeah. That was for, wow. for telegraphy. Anything else? Lori, we certainly appreciate it. It was oh, a wonderful presentation, you. as you can tell from all the questions. Yeah. No, and thank you. Whatever. Thank you. By the way. Oh, oh boy. So on behalf of the Fairland Amateur Radio Club, oh, we well, have thank a you. certificate for you. Thank you. Of, for what you've done. Thanks. Um, really thank you so much. Um, wow, that's very nice of you. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks, thanks for inviting me. Um, I had a great time. I love giving talks at um, amateur radio clubs. Although I am a ham, I passed, my light, I passed the exam probably just barely. So the technical side of things, not really my strong suit, but it's always good to, to give talks with people as knowledgeable as yourself. So thank you so much. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.